Welcome to the Lynn Journals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill, and this week it's a new gear rodeo with product development supervisor Ali Acock Patterson and Lynn Journals blog editor Zach Sutton. Occasionally we like to get together and talk about what we've gotten in recently. Some of it's brand new, some of it's just new to us. It's sort of like a cattle drive, but we're rounding up facts. All right, Ali and Zach, we're going to talk about some new items we just got in. Uh, and just so everybody knows uh, at the outset here, we're in three different places because we're still socially distanced at Lens Journals. I am in my home. Ali, you're in the studio. Is that right? Our podcast studio? That is correct. All alone. And Zach, our blog editor, is in beautiful, sunny Los Angeles. Yep. So, yeah, if we sound different, we're using three different mics in three different places, just as a heads up. Uh, and Allie, I think we want to start just at the top of the list with the C500 Mark II and FX9. And I'm sort of bundling those into one thing because at the moment, I think they're directly competing in the same way that the C300 Mark II and FS7 are kind of directly competing. Is that fair? Yeah, I would definitely say that. They launched about the same time and boasted pretty similar features. And I think they are probably our two most popular cameras right now, the C300 Mark II and FS7, and probably have been for a good three or four years. Pretty much from launch, way back when. Uh, it's, it's important that we cover them, because I think, especially the FX9, in the next year or so, I think it's going to be as popular as the FS7 was. And the FS7, I would say, probably the most used digital cinema camera ever. Yeah, I'd agree with that. We're going to get the C300 Mark III eventually. That might be a more direct comparison to the FX9, but we don't have it in yet. Uh, so we can kind of compare specs. But for now, two kind of equivalent cameras to the C300 Mark II and the FS7 are the C500 Mark II and the FX9. And uh, we'll start with the C500 Mark II. Ali, do you think for this type of camera that a 6K full readout is necessary? Absolutely. Yeah. I know there's still people trying to adopt 4K, but uh, industry wide, I think we're already moving well past that pretty quickly. Um, I mean, they're already talking about 12K monitors and such. So I definitely think that a year from now, the fact that it's a 5.9K sensor, it's going to be like when we got our first 4K sensor cameras. It's just not going to be that exciting anymore. In the same vein, that extra resolution comes with a larger sensor. And that's maybe a more complicated question whether a full frame sensor is necessarily worth all the complications in the cinema market. What do you think about that? Would you prefer a super 35 sensor on this type of camera? I don't know that my preference would necessarily be to have a super 35 sensor versus a full frame sensor, but since it's available, it makes you have to think about it. I don't think for most video applications, having a full frame sensor is crucial. You know, maybe a few years from now, it might be something that's widely adopted, but I don't think it's going to come as fast as that resolution thing we were talking about previously. Uh, Zach, I know you sort of come from the photo side where full frame is a lot more common, obviously. <laughs> Do you have, you know, a, a different approach to it? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I guess I'm interested to see where it stands in the video world, because for me personally, I got started in photography or, you know, digital photography probably 15 years ago. And my first DSLR was a crop sensor. And it was like, you know, the the 5D or the 5D Mark II at the time was sort of like the dream camera. Everybody wanted to upgrade to the full frame. But I feel like in recent years, even in the photo side, uh, a lot of people have scaled back. You know, Fuji's making a lot of really great crop sensor systems. I'm always kind of fascinated to see how important that is in the video side because full frame in a lot of ways seems like it's still sort of a niche market for the video world. So, so yeah, I mean, I do you guys think that full frame? I mean, it sounds like you guys don't think that it is quite the asset and it probably doesn't have quite the benefits as it would in photography. But yeah, I would love to hear more about what your guys' thoughts are on that. My thing is just the types of lenses I typically use. You know, you don't always have a full frame option for some of them, you know, especially if you're shooting, say, anamorphic or something like that. The same way as a lot of these other specs, it's not necessarily one is better and one is worse. It's more just kind of what you're looking for. And I think that full frame sensor is a clear indication of the market that Canon is pointing this thing at. And, you know, whether Canon wants it to or not, I think at least for right now, 
the C500 Mark II and the FX9 are like closely competing. Whereas I think eventually the C300 Mark III will be more of that direct competitor. But broadly, what do you think of the FX9 versus the FS7? I like it. I mean, the body style is pretty similar. Um, Mm -hmm. A few of the connectors are different. I like the connector on the grip better. Uh, It uses that Sony style USB terminal, which is kind of like a deep micro USB. And so it just fits a little more snugly than just the standard like 2.5 mini jack. And then it just feels good. It feels like a very solidly made camera. And for me, when I shoot, the build quality of the camera is something that I always pay attention to because when I feel like I'm shooting with a really sturdy camera, it makes me feel like it's just more reliable in general. Feels very similar to the Venice. Venice, yeah. Yeah. Metal construction and a little bit more like textured. It feels a lot more well built than the sort of like plasticky and a little, I don't know, shaky FS7. <laughs> One thing about Sony's line though is they still don't make video lenses. Um, and Canon has, you know, they've got their Cine E lines, they've got their compact Cine servos, they've got this Sumir's. I'm sure I said that wrong. I think it's Sumir I don't remember. I posted it somewhere and I forgot. But uh, or I forgot already. But they have a lot of video lens options. Uh, Sony teased a 16 to 35 cine style lens, but as far as I can tell, it's never actually been released. I don't know if it's still in development or if it's been, you know, taken off the table as an option. But I would like to see native E mount lenses that are geared towards video instead of just photo. Zach, coming from the photo side, is Sony competing okay with? Canon in new E mount lenses versus new EF mount? Uh, I would say yes. I mean, they they definitely have been way more aggressive on lens development than Canon or Nikon have, but that's also because they're trying to catch up. You know, Canon and Nikon have been developing lenses for tens of years longer than Sony has. So they have, you know, a lineup of lenses that are. 15 years, 20 years old that people are still using. I think at this point, Sony has done a really, really great job, at least on the photo side, of doing a pretty good match of a lot of Canon and Nikon's lenses. And I think that a lot of third parties have probably helped along the way. You know, obviously Sigma makes really great lenses uh, and they make lenses for all brands. So, you know, a year ago, I would have said probably not. But uh, at this point, I think the E-mount lenses... Their lineup's pretty strong, and they kind of have something that can match just about everything, uh, at least on the photo side. But I would assume that they would probably develop something for the video side at some point and kind of branch out and and build video-centered lenses. Next on the list, unless we have any more points to make about the FX9 or C500, I want to kind of combine three things. Uh, The RE Skylink, the Lumen Radio Moonlight, and the RE Orbiter. So the RE Orbiter, we don't have in-house yet as of this recording, but looks to be a very exciting light. I'm not going to get into too many details uh, about the Orbiter itself, except to say that it has a wireless DMX receiver built in. And these three are sort of just an excuse to talk about wireless DMX. Uh, For anyone who isn't familiar, DMX is a light control protocol uh, that has typically been handled through XLR cables. Uh, I believe normally five pin XLR cables. It varies from manufacturer to manufacturer, but at its simplest point, it's just a way to control lights remotely, uh, typically through a central board and has always been a lot more common in live event and news production. Wireless DMX, sometimes referred to as CRMX, takes that same technology, but adapts it to sort of like an ad hoc Wi-Fi network. So this RE Skylink and the Lumen Radio Moonlight allow you to control uh, DMX-compatible lights wirelessly with an iPad. It it hasn't been adapted fully yet, but I think it's a very promising technology. And I'm curious, Zach, since you're a portrait and beauty photographer and Mm -hmm. probably light uh, a lot more than I do, is this a technology you could see yourself using? Yes and no. So... One thing that has definitely like changed a lot of how I work and made my life quite a bit easier is when remote triggers for like lights, when you take your photo, the light fires, it's all done wirelessly. When they started adding tools to allow you to adjust the power on the light from your camera. For me, my product of choice, I use Pro Photo Lighting and their controller allows me to adjust the light power in one 
tenth of a stop increments from my camera. So like, you know, I typically will work with at least three lights when I'm in the studio. And instead of having to get up and adjust the lighting setting for one thing or, you know, turn on one light and turn off one light, I'm able to sort of do it all just from my camera. And that tool is a huge, huge, huge asset. And then in regards to video lighting, you know, I'm, I am I don't shoot much video at all, but I'm always looking at video lighting as sort of an opportunity to do something different within the photo world. And I've noticed in, in recent years, and DMX is advertised all the time, and it seems like it's a really cool tool in theory, I guess, but everything that I've like looked into it beyond just being like, oh, what's this? It seems like it is sort of cumbersome for like most people to really get started in. Have you ever or would you ever light with continuous lights for your still work? Yeah, I and I do. Um, I have two Kino flows. And even when I bought those, I bought those probably five years ago. And when I grabbed those, you know, it was recommended that I get the one with the DMX module so I could adjust everything easily. I ended up not getting it, but I have a number of lights in my studio that are designed for video and have DMX outputs on them. I just have never looked at them beyond that. And you're not wrong about it possibly being cumbersome. It took us quite some time to really get a handle on our first DMX products. Yeah, we went through a few different controllers before we found one that like worked consistently. Yeah, and there, you know, even then there were still some caveats that we had to take into consideration as internally as we're processing these new products. If I needed to sell this sort of wireless DMX control to a videographer, I think the biggest difference would not be in just simple control of your light. If you set this whole thing up, you're you're going to end up with a with an iPad that's running one of two pieces of software, either uh, Luminaire or uh, Stellar. Stellar is Ari's in-house developed app. It's Ari Light specific. Luminaire is third party and compatible with pretty much any light uh, with a DMX input. So you can, you know, control your lights in the way that like a gaffer would. You can dim remotely, you can change RGB values, color temperature remotely, pretty much anything you need to do. But the main difference uh, is that since you've got software at your fingertips, you can do things a gaffer wouldn't be able to do. Uh, So programming live. Um, So you can change RGB values over the course of a period of time. You can set all your lights in house to dim after 30 seconds or when you hit a trigger on the iPad. Uh, So for video shooting, I think it especially opens up a, a lot of creative avenues to change lighting live on set in a much easier way. Right. Well, and I have a number of like, I have a couple video lights that I'll use for just kind of various things. And it seems pretty common for video lights to have like built in effects, whether it be like the cop car Mm -hmm. or like TV static or like candle light. And when you're using more than one of those lights, it's almost impossible to like, if you're, for example, using the cop car setting, it's almost impossible to sync those up by, you know, just using the back of the light and like, you know, trying to press the effect on at the same time and hoping that they're in sync. And it just seems like DMX makes all of those kind of things a whole lot easier. It's handy, but it is, you know, not the simplest thing in the world to set up. Sure. Next on the list, the Shure SM7B. Allie, I want to ask you about this one. Have you used this mic yet? I actually used it before we ever carried it. I did a little bit of studio work, voiceover stuff, and it's in every studio I've ever been in. Yes. Yeah. This one's also a pretty broad definition of new. This is uh, new to us, but the Shure SM7B, if you have done any audio work at all ever, uh, you have probably worked with this microphone. It's been around since the 70s Um, and it sounds great. That is the microphone I'm using to record in my office and I love it. I don't really have a lot to add except that I think it's the best dialogue microphone we carry i wish we had more of them so we could only record the podcast with this mic it's uh yeah sure by itself i mean it's definitely been an industry standard my dad was in a touring band in the 60s and 70s and he still uses a sure beta 58 and he's always joked that you can use it to you know crack open a can of something if you need it and put it back on an xlr cable and it works just fine the Shure SM7B is a little more, isn't quite as robust as those handheld style mics just by design. It, you know, it's not designed for a whole lot of hand holding and moving around and stuff. But for voiceover work, 
um, especially if you're in a controlled environment, it, there really probably isn't anything at this price point that even closely compares. Sure. And I've never used this mic personally, but I, I know at least with Sure, the SM58, I believe it is. I think I still have a box of those somewhere around my house um, from when I used to play music and like went on tour and stuff. And they were like $100 mics, but literally everybody used them. Right. Uh, and they've been around for, you know, forever. One thing to know is that the default gain is a little low. Uh, so I, I have mine in my house running into something that I can adjust the gain with. Uh, but if you are just running this like straight into a board, depending on what you're recording, you might need a cloud lifter, which will increase your signal gain. Uh, but we have that available too. It's it's on the website and pretty cheap. And I highly recommend grabbing it, even if you aren't positive that you're going to need it. It's just a cheap little inline preamplifier. Ours is a variable impedance. So um, it's really just kind of a handy thing to have around if you're going to be doing any kind of vocal work. All right. We'll take a quick break here. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk about some more gear. And now Lens Reynolds brings you a meditation moment. Close your eyes, lean back, and listen to my voice. You feel yourself getting sleepy, relaxed, drifting on a cloud. You love this podcast. You want to give this podcast a five-star rating. You want to write a positive review of it and even subscribe to it. You know that will bring you a feeling of joy and contentment. When I count to three, you will wake up refreshed and go straight to the review page. One, two, three. Welcome back. We are talking about new products we've got in. I'm with Allie and Zach. And uh, Allie, I think this one was your edition. We're going to cover the PXW Z750. It was one of my choices. Um, the reason I wanted us to mention this one briefly is just because it's pre-order in the United States. So I'm not honestly sure how, at the time of this recording, we already have a coffee in-house. Um, we've actually had a few customers email in just to make sure we actually have it available because the only place they're aware of it shipping currently is in Europe. And so somehow Lens Rentals managed to get their hands on a really early copy, which is awesome. But it's a unique offering for us because we started carrying the Ursa broadcast last year and it was a lot more popular than we expected it to be. The whole B4 system was a lot more popular. And the Z750 is based on very standard Sony broadcast style camera. It out of the box, you cannot mount it to a tripod. It's only got a shoulder pad and a VCT locking plate, but it is 4K three chip sensor. It is a global sensor, which is awesome. It does use the B4 system. So you've got lenses that are going to balance typically really well uh, with the B mount brick battery on the back. So it's even though it's kind of a larger camera, it does sit on the shoulder very well. It's really well designed. It gives you a lot of workflow options. One of the top features I really like is you can do QFHD and HD recordings simultaneously to the same S by S Pro Plus card, which is pretty interesting feature. So let's take a step back. What? So you say that it has global shutter just for uh, us dumb photo people out here. Um, what do you mean by global shutter? Ryan, you want to you want to try to answer that one? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll try to be brief. So if you picture a sensor as a series of photo sites, right? So mm -hmm. let's say we're talking about a 4K sensor. You've got 4,096 horizontal pixels, uh, 2,160 vertical pixels, if I'm remembering sure. all that right. So typically a camera's processor can't handle information from all of those pixels coming in at once. So what it will do is trigger either individual pixels in a row or sections of the sensor at a time. Uh, so rather than every pixel reporting the information it's getting to the processor all at once, you'll get a line by line report. Mm -hmm. uh, typically that happens so quickly. Uh, you know, we're not talking about this process taking a second. We're talking about like hundredths of a second. So typically sure. this process happens so fast that you can't really see a visible difference 
where it does come in are in specific instances. And you can see adva- uh, examples of this. Um, it's a little bit hard to describe what this looks like, but you can see examples of it if you Google rolling shutter artifacts. Mm-hmm. Uh, the easiest example or is Jello panning. Effect. Yeah, I yeah, say, exactly. I think, yeah, the most common is probably just the Jello effect. If you're moving the camera back and forth, it kind of does a weird jello thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's it's typically easiest to see that like panning left and right on something like a light pole or anything that's like vertical. So since the top of your sensor is reporting information to your processor before the bottom of your sensor, a straight line when you're panning back and forth will start to look wobbly. It's if you've ever done this as a child, it's the exact same thing as that trick you do with a pencil. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I'm literally pantomiming it right now. I'm sure our listeners have seen this weird optical illusion. It's very, very similar to that. So a straight line will sort of look wobbly. That, what I'm talking about, uh, portions of the sensor reporting to the processor at a different time is a rolling shutter, a global shutter. Every pixel on the sensor sends their information to the processor all at once. So you don't see those rolling shutter artifacts. Got it. Which makes it kind of a badass ENG EFP style camera. Right. Yeah. It's it's important for that because you're likely going to be moving around a lot more than you would with like a cinema camera, maybe panning more quickly. And the smaller sensor makes those artifacts more noticeable if they're there, but they won't be in this case. Which is why it costs so much. But at least the lenses typically aren't going to be as expensive as comparable cinema lenses. Right. To go back to what you were saying about B4 being more popular than we expected, that is absolutely right. Our B4 stuff has done really well. And publicly on our podcast, I would like to say I was not for getting B4 stuff in when we did it. We've been like debating back and forth for a long, long time about whether or not to actually carry B4 lenses because we've had requests. But typically, at least my thinking was people wanted B4 cameras because they owned their own B4 lenses and just wanted to use those. But yeah, you were right about that, Allie, is what I'm saying. The B4 (laughs) stuff has done very, very well. That was Allie's call. I just advocated for it. And it makes sense. Like B4 stuff and Zach or for anybody who's not really familiar with the sensor type, these B4 lenses, they're working with a two third inch like sensor. So much smaller than you would typically find in a cinema camera, but huge advantages for ENG are news gathering because you can design lenses around that sensor that have a much wider focal length range for a lot less money than if you were designing lenses for like a Super 35 sensor. Uh, ENG lenses of this type, these B4 lenses, are typically described in terms of their zoom ratio. Like our our Fujinon, we have a 5.5 to 100. That is often referred to just as an 18x. You'll see 20x, 22x. And they're a lot faster. It's, so it's a 5.5 to 100 with a constant f1.8, which it would be probably impossible to design <laughs> for a Super 35 sensor. And if you did pull it off, it would be the hugest, most expensive lens you've ever seen in your life. But this is a relatively affordable lens that is not super heavy because it only has to cover a small sensor. Uh, next on the list, um, Ali, this was also your edition and you'll find uh, listeners that we have sort of a pattern. Ali is a lot more familiar with a lot of this broadcast, uh, equipment than I am or, uh, really any of our other employees are. So what do you think makes the new ATEM mini and mini pro switchers, uh, stand out over our other options? One of the coolest things Blackmagic has implemented this year is the ability to do camera control over HDMI when you're using the one of the pocket cameras, the either pocket camera 4K or 6K with an A10 mini switcher. So basically, let's say you had a four camera shoot and you're on location and you want to make sure all of your cameras match. You can, from a central place, use that A10 mini switcher software to go in and actually tailor like the gamma curves of each camera rather than having an operator try and match to the guy next to him and so on and so forth. You have one central person who's looking at the display side by side and can adjust the iris settings and saturation settings, whatever they want, so that all the cameras are uniformly matched. And I I mean, over HDMI, I'm not even really sure how they're doing it. It's pretty impressive though. The 
A10 Mini Pro definitely has some advantages over the standard Mini. Like it has a dedicated hardware streaming engine. And the purpose of that is so that you can stream over Ethernet and you're going to, in theory, see fewer drop frames as well as um, with the A10 Mini Pro because they freed up the USB-C port. You can also use that to record to external drives, which is also obviously really handy. I wasn't aware of that before uh, we started talking about all this, and that's super helpful. Um, do you know if that's, is that program only or ISO recordings as well? I believe it is currently program only, but it wouldn't surprise me if at some point in the future you are able to do ISO as well. A little bit more detail about what we're talking about. So what you can record uh, currently to USB-C drives is the program output, meaning your switched output. So whatever you're switching to, the same thing that would be going to a monitor or whatever streaming service you're using. You're only seeing whatever camera you've chosen as the live camera versus an ISO recording, meaning that you're constantly recording the feed from every camera. So you've got the streamed program record or every isolated feed. So you can then adjust your cuts and post. And since... We're on the topic. Another big advantage of the Pro over the standard A10 Mini is you do have a multi-view output, whereas on the standard Mini, your only output it's going to be, it's default to program. You can set it to be preview, but at any rate, you're only getting one or the other. The A10 Mini Pro, you actually have a full multi-view output that also shows you your audio mixer and your streaming status. So you can actually use your multi-view monitor to monitor the health of your streaming signal, which is obviously really helpful to not have to manage so many different components. Uh, Zach, I guess it's time to get into some photo products. Do you have anything upcoming new that you're excited about? No, not really. Uh, you know, the last the last podcast that we had uh, last season was sort of a new gear roundup for the photo world. And not a lot has changed. I, I feel like every year this is sort of known as kind of like the dead zone for a lot of photo stuff. They announce earlier in the year and then they also announce kind of like in the fall. So... We're just kind of waiting, you know, obviously Canon still has the R5, EOS R5 that is being teased. And hopefully, you know, by the time that this is released, we'll have more information on that. But then the only other real big announcement was Profoto announced their OCF uh, version two modifiers, which are essentially just their, their modifiers designed for the B10, the B1, the B10 plus, uh, the B2s. These are modifiers that, uh, allow you to quickly change. So they came out with a new gel system, which allows you to quickly adjust gelling, different lights. They came out with a new barn door system that allows you kind of to flag the lights with ease. And then they came out with a uh, new snoot that is rubberized. So the idea is that you can pack it away in a bag pretty easily and painlessly. And that's sort of it. <laughs> One interesting thing that is in the photo world was the release of the RF 24 to 105, the one without the fixed aperture. I was kind of confused by the decision to release a variable aperture version of the 24 to 105 in the RF mount when they had an already super popular F4 version. Yeah. Well, isn't the uh, variable one, isn't it like super affordable? I assume so. I assume that about all variable aperture lenses, but let me look it up. It is mega, mega cheap. I'm looking at the product page now. It's $26 for seven days. Okay. Uh, which versus the twenty nine dollar difference in a week's time? Yeah, so it's a four hundred dollar lens on B and H. Yeah. Um, okay, I guess in that regard, it makes sense. Doesn't it also have some macro function that the other twenty four to one hundred five doesn't? Yeah, it has. I think one to two macro, which isn't like exceptional macro. Most macro lenses are one to one comparison, so this is half of that. But for a $400 lens, you know, if you need a $400 lens that can, you know, has a pretty broad zoom range, uh, has some macro functionality and has image stabilization built in. I mean, it's a it seems like it's a pretty good option if you're on on that budget. It, it's kind of designed to be probably more of like a, a beginner lens, a starter lens kind of price conscious. Uh, well, all right, guys, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Lens Journals podcast. All the products we covered here will be linked to in the show notes if you'd like to learn a little more or check them out for yourself. The 
The Lens Rentals Podcast is a production of LensRentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at LensRentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sokala will leave you with an inspirational quote.